I'm going to take a few minutes of uh, the session's time to give you an overview about the Global Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture, and indeed part of the main theme that we are meeting this afternoon. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, exactly what is the motivation for this alliance, the Global Alliance on Climate Smart Agriculture. And this is based on the fact that we are dealing with an issue that cuts across especially three major sectors or disciplines. We're talking about agriculture, we're talking about climate, and for many of us is also about livelihoods in everywhere you would look at that. So, and this is also to recognize that it's actually none of these three in their own spaces is about actually where they come together. And therefore, the issues that, uh, how do we move out of our comfort zones? We may be agriculturalists, we may be in climate change, we may be concerned more about livelihoods. How do we move out of those uh, seemingly comfort zones and come into this common space where we need to interact, where we need to bring our efforts uh, to, together in terms of uh, the greater good that we want to achieve. And in this form, we actually have learned, and there are very, very strong aspirations, commitments, especially when you come into Africa, but I know the same in Asia, in Latin America, and also even in, in, in Europe and the Americas, that one of the things that is going to make success a reality is actually about alliances and partnerships. And this is underlined in a way that we've probably never seen before. And it's an area where we're saying we need to look at how we come into partnerships, what are the alliances, and how these are actually key instruments of making success in our common uh, agendas. It's also uh, an important feature in the alliance that this is going to require a lot of learning, a lot of uh, understanding of what are the problems, what are the issues, what are the solutions, and actually innovate together in the way probably we've never done before. We're looking at, yes, uh, extreme, extreme changes in, in various aspects of how we do business in agriculture, in climate change, in terms of policies, in terms of technologies, and therefore innovations and probably extremely radical innovations that we probably don't even uh, can think of at the moment, maybe the order we go. So the Global Alliance is especially an instrument, is a platform that is coming together to catalyze, to stimulate this learning from one another, this uh, innovating, co-creating of, of knowledge, of uh, understanding, and indeed coming up with the solutions that cuts across our various interests, our various circumstances. And the Global Alliance does actually believe, and we see it all the time in the dialogue, that this is not a, a third world, a developing world, a developed world issue. It's actually an issue that is affecting all of us in different ways, but indeed something that is at the heart of uh, uh, economic development, as well as uh, sustaining our environmental uh, sustainability. The Global Alliance is, uh, is active across the globe, as I'm saying. Uh, we actually are getting active membership in the Latin America, in North America, in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, as far as the uh, Southeast Asia. And one of the things we are finding is the richness of the dialogue across all these uh, uh, constituencies. And indeed, you find that there's something to learn from each one of those. The Alliance is organized around the three action groups, and that provides space for any members, any constituencies that are interested to actually contribute in a very voluntary way, contribute to that dialogue to co-create knowledge, uh, understanding, and indeed the motivation that ultimately then we contribute to the action at community level, at national level, regional level, and, and expect that uh, in Africa, for instance, the heads of state and government made a commitment last June 
to have at least 25 million farm households practicing clean smart agriculture by 2025. And that is, yes, uh, you're talking about uh, just over a quarter maybe of the farmers there, but it's a significant aspect, especially when you look at the majority of those, almost uh, all of them are actually smallholder, uh, nearly subsistence farmers. So indeed, the Global Alliance is also very mindful of the fact that at the end of the day, is about contributing to the members' intention to act, to act and actually move implementation, move impact uh, in terms of the synergies between agriculture, climate, and livelihoods uh, in our national development programs, our regional development initiatives, and whether you're talking about business, you're talking about uh, government policies, or you're talking about uh, concerns at community level, uh, especially in terms of civil society, that all those are actually taken into account. So thank you very much for this time. Thank you. Well, I want to thank uh, everyone who is here today. I'm Tom Vilsack, uh, U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, and I am certainly privileged and honored to be with my colleagues from Costa Rica, Ireland, and Vietnam representing a broad array of farming populations. Uh, earlier this afternoon, we were sharing statistics that we found out that Vietnam has 15 million free, uh, small uh, freeholders. Uh, Ireland has about 50,000 uh, farmers, I'm told, and Costa Rica, around 250,000. And in the US, while we have uh, technically about 2.2 million farmers, about 200,000 to 300,000 farmers produce about 85% of what we grow and raise in the US. And we are proud uh, to be part of this alliance, recognizing the challenge that we all globally have of meeting the ever-increasing needs of a growing world population at a time when the climate is changing and impacting and affecting what is grown, how it's grown, and how much is grown. So we're fortunate to be part of this alliance. We understand and appreciate the opportunity to share, the opportunity to learn from one another, uh, the opportunity to make sure that all of the ideas, uh, whether it's from government or NGOs or civil society, uh, from farm groups, are basically accumulated and utilized to try to allow farmers everywhere in the world to be as efficient and as effective as possible uh, and to be as sustainable as possible. In the U.S., we have seen uh, the consequence of a changing climate, whether it's the California drought, uh, the wildfires in the western part of the United States, uh, or the fact that we're seeing growing seasons in some parts of the United States extending and in some parts uh, shrinking. And that's why the president, uh, our president, was uh, very focused on making sure the U.S. contributed significantly to these uh, Paris discussions by uh, challenging the entire country uh, to reduce its emissions uh, by somewhere between 26 and 28 uh, percent based on 2005 levels uh, over the course of the next decade. Uh, that's an aggressive plan uh, that the U.S. has put forward, and it was his expectation uh, that agriculture would be a contributor uh, to those emission reduction goals. Uh, we have a lot to learn uh, from one another. We have a lot to share. Uh, beginning with uh, the efforts of the United States Department of Agriculture and our Feed the Future initiative, which is focused on helping uh, small countries uh, in all parts of the world uh, to encourage uh, their farmers uh, to be as effective and as efficient as possible using conventional uh, methods. Uh, we've already uh, provided training to over 7 million producers uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, in Central America, and parts of Asia. We joined initially at, uh, in the uh, COP meetings in Copenhagen, uh, established the Global Research Alliance, which was designed to put 44 countries working collaboratively together uh, to do research on rice, crop production, and livestock production, uh, nitrogen stewardship, as well as developing common terminology so that we would be able to communicate more effectively and ensure that our research uh, in all aspects of climate adaptation and mitigation could be shared uh, and used in the most effective and efficient way. The U.S. has been very involved as well in researching uh, our own capacity to be more efficient, whether it's cultivars that are allowing for growing seasons to be uh, shortened, uh, or new crops that are drought resistant, uh, heat resistant, uh, able to function in a more intense uh, climate circumstance. 
uh, or whether it's ways in which we can provide greater efficiency of livestock, reducing the levels of methane by, by capturing methane or reducing uh, the total amount of methane that's produced during livestock production. These are, this is information that can be shared by the U.S. Uh, as we learn from each other. And most recently, uh, we established what we refer to as the 10 building blocks uh, that are focused on using our existing programs to work with our agricultural community to double the rate of emission reductions uh, that agriculture is responsible for uh, in the U.S. Currently today, agriculture uh, essentially uh, sequesters roughly uh, 60 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, we want to, in the next 10 years, double that level. And these 10 building blocks are focused on a wide variety uh, of initiatives. Uh, one is focused on soil health and the need for additional cover crop activity. One is focused on the utilization of water and better and more appropriate irrigation systems. One is focused on grazing patterns of livestock. Uh, we have a significant focus on uh, forestry, both urban forestry, private forest land ownership, as well as the land that the U.S. government owns through U.S. Forest Service and the Department of Interior lands, being more and better stewards uh, of that land. Uh, focusing on uh, renewable energy uh, in a sustainable and creative way uh, and utilizing wood uh, more effectively uh, so that the carbon uh, is, uh, continues to be stored uh, in a number of building projects that we're working on. These 10 building blocks uh, will form uh, a voluntary incentive-based system uh, with metrics and milestones uh, that are extremely important to follow on an annual basis so that we know that we are meeting our goals and are held accountable uh, for the emission reductions. Uh, the Alliance is an, another opportunity, but by no means the only opportunity for a sharing of information. Now, that's why we are also committed to the Open Data Initiative uh, for Global Agriculture uh, and Nutrition, uh, where countries are now sharing information in a very open and transparent way uh, so that, again, we can deal with this issue collaboratively. I will say in, in conclusion that this is a a, a serious challenge for us. If we are to feed somewhere between 9 and 10 billion people uh, over the next 35 to 40 years as the world population grows, we're going to have to increase global food production by somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 percent. I've been told that that 60 percent increase in food production will require as much innovation and efficiency in agriculture in the next 30 to 40 years as we have experienced in the last 10,000 years. That's why collaborations, alliances, and partnerships are so important, why we need to learn from each other, why we need to understand and appreciate that agriculture is diverse, uh, is different from country to country, uh, that culture uh, is certainly involved in, uh, and included in agriculture uh, and has to be respected uh, as we work collaboratively together. Uh, the U.S. was a, a happy uh, participant in this alliance, knowing full well that we have lessons to learn and lessons to share. Uh, so I look forward to uh, the presentations from my colleagues and the questions uh, that will be posed by the audience. Uh, but we are going to be issuing a report uh, this afternoon, which is a call to action, uh, which suggests that the pace of reduction in global food security that we've seen, uh, insecurity that we've seen the last several years, could potentially be impacted negatively by climate change. I remember my first COP uh, meeting in Copenhagen when I was secretary uh, for just a couple of months when we talked about a billion people who were food insecure in the world. Today that number is 805 million, so we're headed in the right direction. The question is whether we as a global community will be able to work collaboratively together to continue that level of progress and that pace of progress, uh, or whether uh, we will succumb to uh, a, a, an approach that doesn't provide for collaboration, doesn't provide for a collective response uh, to climate, and doesn't recognize the significant uh, concerns it may create in food production and the impact that that will have disproportionately uh, on poorer people and poorer nations. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I would uh, like to present a special greeting to my uh, colleagues and partners here at the, at the table. Thank you for the invitation to this uh, event. Um, 
I'm going to talk about a uh, case study of Costa Rica as a case study of climate smart agriculture. I have to start by saying that I'm a firm believer in climate smart agriculture. I think that there, that is uh, the way to go. Um, we, as a country, we have a history of investment in sustainability. Um, we, very early on, we invested in renewable sources of energy. 94% of our energy uh, comes from re renewable sources. In fact, the first four months of this year, we didn't burn one drop of oil in producing electricity. Uh, we, from the 70s, we have done a lot of effort in nature conservation. In a country, uh, 50,000 square kilometers in um, extension, we have about 50% of our territory covered by forest. And we have done all that without compromising our development. We have to say we have, for a developing country, our development indicators in some areas are not too bad. We have about the same literacy rate, the same infant mortality rate, and the same life expectancy at birth, uh, at birth as most, most uh, European countries. Uh, we have put incentives into sustainable agriculture uh, by uh, payment for um, environmental services in agroforestry. And we have recognition for environmental benefits for organic agriculture based on a tax on gasoline on the concept that the person that pollutes pays for uh, cleaning the environment. Uh, but we do have growing concerns about climate change. We have some very strong impacts on uh, of climate in our agriculture. Um, Secretary Velsak already mentioned droughts. We have ha experienced the same problems, droughts in one area of the country, floods in another area of the country. That's, that's, so that has created a huge awareness of the importance of working on climate change if we want to keep an agriculture. Agriculture has a threefold relationship with climate change. It produces greenhouse gases, so it contributes to climate change, but at the same time it's one of the major activities that is affected by climate change. But also agriculture has the potential to reduce greenhouse gases and reduce, mitigate the impact of climate change. In Costa Rica, because this clean energy that I just mentioned, uh, that makes that, uh, in a relative basis, agriculture has a very uh, much higher contribution than in the rest of the world to uh, climate change. 40%, roughly, 38% of our uh, emissions, the country emissions, come from agriculture. So climate smart agriculture becomes crucial. We, um, within the climate smart, that word smart has, has to be grasped in its full meaning, meaning that smart is knowledge intensive, knowledge based agriculture. We need to do things based on knowledge and that uh, sharing that Secretary Vilsack is very important. We, uh, as a country, we have been working on uh, nationally appropriate mitigated mitigation strategies, so-called NAMAS, in the coffee sector and in the livestock sector, those two sectors together account for 65% of the emissions in, uh, in agriculture in Costa Rica. But we also know from experience that we can uh, work towards carbon neutrality in agriculture. Why do we know that? Because we already have carbon neutral coffee farms. We already have carbon neutral livestock farms. And these NAMA projects give us the, the framework to work towards carbon neutrality in those two sectors. And I have to say I dream that if all agriculture in the world were carbon neutral, we would be able to neutralize 15% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the world. The NAMA projects that have been explained 
earlier in this session, and we'll be explaining other sessions in this um, in this COP21. Uh, bring together stakeholders, government, and academia to really be able to impact productivity while adapting to climate change and mitigating carbon. The three objectives are being uh, together, are brought together in the, in the NAMAS. We need to, in the way forward, we need to go from theory to practice. Because in theory, emissions in the agricultural sector from nitrous oxide, for example, from methane, are inefficiencies of the system. Methane from livestock is carbon that did not go to produce meat. Nitrous oxide is nitrogen that, that we put there, we fertilize, we may put some money there, and nitrous oxide is nitrogen that did not come to produce protein, the protein that we need. So those are inefficiencies in the system. So if we become eco-efficient, we can achieve productivity. So we need to bridge that gap from theory to practice. We need to think outside of the box. We need to think outside of the agricultural sector. We need to think, or we need to move from climate-smart agriculture to climate-smart society. I would like to finish this participation with a quote from a report of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development from 2013. It's a report called Wake Up Before, is it, Before it Is Too Late. It's a report that talks or nails down the problems with agriculture, environment, and climate change. The first chapter, written by the head of the UNCTAD, Dr. Ulrich Hoffman, which is called Agriculture at the Crossroads, he mentions that one of the unresolved agenda items is that we need to reform global agricultural trade rules, giving greater policy space for assuring national food sovereignty, climate change adaptation and resilience, rethink focus on integrated smallholders into global supply chains. I think we have a challenge there. We cannot move towards uh, climate smart agriculture, towards adaptation of climate change, if we don't think that we need to change some rules in global trade, especially those rules that allow us to share knowledge, to share the products of biodiversity, so we can really move towards adaptation to climate change. Thank you very much. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's clear the climate change will not spare an, anyone. Like in U.S. and Costa Rica, uh, in central region of Vietnam, you are facing the worst in 60 years drought, and at the same time, water level in the Mekong River is lowest in 90 years that we have record, maybe uh, even uh, for a longer period. And Vietnam is forecasted as one of the countries most affected by climate change, particularly by the sea level rise. If the sea level rises one meter, about 39% of the Mekong Delta Vietnam main rice basket uh, will be inundated unless major investment are made. And it's very clear that we need to work together urgently to cope with common challenge of climate change. In Vietnam, we are fully aware of the serious challenge in responding to climate change. And we are trying our best to implement adaptation actions. 
the national strategy on climate change and the national green growth strategy have been adopted. And uh, we work out a specific program for agriculture to respond to climate change. Uh, as in Vietnam, agriculture uh, occupy about 20% of GDP, but uh, it is a main source of uh, income and employment for 70% of our population. And agriculture in Vietnam occupy also 30% of Vietnam emission. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we fully committed uh, to join international effort of reduction of greenhouse gas emission. And we have uh, submitted our uh, commitment to this uh, uh, forum that we cut 8% of greenhouse gas by 2030 compared to the business as usual uh, development scenario. But uh, to a possible reduction of 25% with uh, international uh, support. But that is planned. Uh, actually, for many years, we've been trying uh, to carry out concrete measures uh, in rice production, uh, you know that uh, Vietnam is producing a lot of rice, but uh, rice produced on so half of uh, agriculture emission. And from a hectare of rice, uh, a lot of uh, methane gas uh, emitted that is even more toxic than CO2. And that's why we work out a package and transfer to farmers. And with that package, we can reduce uh, uh, emission by about 20, 30%. And but at the same time, to increase productivity by 10 and 20% and increase farmer income. In coffee production, we've been working with Nestle and some other partners on pilot scheme. Uh, the, similarly, we work out a package of technology and transfer to farmers. And reason was to reduce of water usage by 30% and in increase productivity by 10% and farmers income by 14%, but emission reduced by more than 50%. In livestock, we have been assisting farmers to win biogas schemes. And by so far, we uh, were able to bin up 145,000 different schemes. And that have such remarkably to reduce emission. In forestry, uh, we have been trying our best to recover uh, barren hill. And in early 90s, last century, forestry coverage in Vietnam was below 30%. But this year, uh, our coverage is nearly 41%. And <clears throat> uh, we are uh, working together with uh, UN uh, agencies uh, to pilot a red program with support from uh, Norway government. And with those information, I want to say that we can do many things in agriculture to have to reduce emission and to mitigate climate change. And though, I, though effort are triple and will, it's not necessarily that to reduce emission and reduce productivity. Otherwise, we can, we can get at the same time 
uh, increase productivity uh, and reduce emission and increase uh, farmers' income. Yeah. So now I think I can say that uh, we are ready to go ahead. We are ready to scan it up. And what we need, we need strong commitment from government, from stakeholders, farmers, businesses, scientific agencies. We need right policy intensive in incentives to encourage farmers and businesses to take active participation. And uh, we need also strong support to farmers, especially small, poor one. Uh, in case of Vietnam, we have 15 million small holders uh, living in countryside. And we have 25 uh, workers. So we need to support them. In, in many of our pilot scheme, it's very clear. They want to adapt, but they need uh, us to support them with technology, with credit, etc., and marketing. And of course, we need strong international cooperation, particularly for sharing experiences and transferring technology. I think, join hand, we can change. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Ireland's ambassador to France. I'm delighted to be here, even if I am here as a, a substitute today for Ireland's Minister uh, Hayes, who unfortunately couldn't, couldn't make it to Paris. Um, great pleasure to be at the US Pavilion. I, I was here on Monday when the, the leaders met. Uh, I, I was accompanying uh, the Irish Prime Minister, Taoiseach Enda Kenny. We even managed to grab a bit of time with uh, President Obama in the margins. But at the top of uh, my remarks today, I just wanted to say if ever there was a doubt about the importance of the, the initiative we have underway here, I think after Monday, it's quite clear it's not just a climate change conference that's underway, it's really something much more fundamental. And I think as we listen to the three previous speakers, they were, we're in no doubt about the, the scale of the challenge. Ireland thinks that the, the climate smart agriculture part of that challenge is really a key instrument. And uh, it makes it really gratifying to be in a position to be here today to, to speak to you about some of the steps we're taking. As the Secretary said at the top, we think this can only be done, frankly, through collaboration and sharing of best practice of learning. So today's an important opportunity to do that. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what uh, we in Ireland are doing. Um, if I were to put it really simply, I think that you could say that in Ireland we're on a transformative pathway and sustainability is, is actually at the heart of what we're about. So it's a, it's a sort of a natural fit that we're enthusiastic supporters of, of climate smart agriculture and, and its three pillars. Uh, in Ireland, we, we have an approach to carbon neutrality in agriculture, land use, including forestry, uh, which really doesn't compromise capacity for sustainable food production. Um, I'll take a few minutes just to illustrate what I think we can legitimately call a holistic approach to climate smart agriculture in Ireland. We like to think we're smart at home but we're also smart in our overseas development programs, which comes to this collaborative uh, approach again. A word first maybe on the challenges. Uh, I felt when we were in the room on Monday that the global leaders really were, were calling the uh, world to attention in a way, uh, because we're facing into what I personally and professionally think is probably one of the greatest challenges mankind has ever faced, and that is fundamentally feeding the world while saving the planet. Uh, we absolutely need to find a way to produce food that, in a way that preserves the soil uh, and water quality, protects our biodiversity, and mitigates the impact on climate. Now, Ireland, both at the EU level uh, and the UN, the greater level here, argues that that needs to be coherent. We need to address the twin challenges, climate change and food security, in a way that doesn't force us to reduce sustainable production. We are, uh, and I underline are, making progress. Uh, 
in our world here in, on, in Europe at the European Council just last year, we adopted a decision uh, that said basically that sustainable intensification in agriculture is a part of EU climate policy. And I can't underline what an important step that was for those of us within the EU and then for the role that the EU plays on the more global stage. Uh, as part of the overall EU reduction targets, there's also recognition uh, of the fact that mitigation can be achieved through afforestation. Again, very important policy statements and choices that we're making as Ireland through our role in the European Union. Our own food production in Ireland, a uh, serious one, we're a major meat, dairy, and food exporting country. Uh, the agri-food sector is one of our most important indigenous manufacturing industries. We directly employ 50,000 people in that industry. Our ruminant production, which is the mainstream of Irish agriculture, is very much based on sustainability principles. Uh, we like to think that we have huge natural advantages, although I have to say as I read this, not every Irish person agrees with this as an advantage, but we have a temperate climate and more than ample rainfall, um, which when you bring them together gives us excellent grass growth. And we like to think that's why you, many of you, you might know us, particularly in the United States, as Ireland of the 40 shades of green. Uh, our natural advantages help us. Uh, something uh, rather remarkable, 90% of the diet of dairy and beef animals is composed of grazed grass or silage grown on the farm in permanent pastures where the livestock themselves are reared. Independent research has shown that Ireland is one of the world's most efficient food producers. The carbon footprint per unit of output speaks for itself. We have the joint lowest carbon footprint per unit in the European Union for dairy production. And when it comes to beef production, we come in joint fifth. We're continuing to invest in climate smart agriculture at home. We're very efficient already, but we're implementing measures to drive down the greenhouse gas intensity even further. Our rural development program, which is worth about 4 billion euros, is strongly targeted towards climate action and environmental benefits, including knowledge transfer programs. Again, this opportunity to share and collaborate. Uh, we want to bring the, the latest innovative research and practices directly to our own farmers and then beyond. Our unique beef data and genomics program will not only provide environmental sustainability for beef production, it will also bring economic benefits directly to the farmers at their own level. It coordinates and collates breeding data from a range of sources right from the top level at government, government departments, down to individual farm level. We have agri-environmental schemes uh, which help to create an understanding of the need to protect the environment and sustainable land management. And farmers in those schemes can choose which climate smart options to implement in their land. We believe that the local solutions are key. We're now emerging in Ireland as a world leader in sustainable auditing. And we have already personalized carbon footprinting and planners for more than half of all our farms in Ireland. And we haven't stopped looking for more innovative solutions. We've also developed the Origin Green Initiative, uh, which is aimed at agribusinesses from farm through to retail. We have a pasture profit index, a carbon navigator tool, and all of these are aimed at, at reducing carbon emissions uh, per unit of production. FoodWise 2025 is a new strategy for the development of the Irish agri-food sector over the next decade. It has sustainable production also at its core, and it's a strategy that's underwritten by a commitment to measurement and monitoring of the sustainability credentials, and we believe that's a very important aspect of the overall undertaking. On Ireland's broader uh, influence uh, beyond the island, uh, our own well-known international engagement, uh, we, we have a number of important initiatives, of course, including this one that we partake in, uh, but we're also founders of the Livestock Environmental Assessment and Performance Partnership, otherwise known as LEAP, and we currently hold the chair of that. Irish Aid, which is the Irish government's excellent program for overseas development, has spent just last year 21 million euros on agricultural programs, and 90% of those programs are climate-proofed. 
Irish Aid is working hand in glove also with Chagasch, which is the Irish uh, Agricultural Development Authority, where we want to ensure that expertise will be available to partner countries as we work with them to develop sustainable agriculture. An outstanding example of that work that we have underway is work being done on the improvement of potato yields in Africa. And for any of you who know Irish history, you might say that Irish, of course, know a little thing or two about potato production. Uh, but what we're doing now in the uh, context of supporting our African partners is that we want to strengthen local knowledge bases. So we're funding and training, for example, Ethiopian doctoral students. Uh, disseminating the research in Ethiopia will help local subsistence farmers and ultimately, hopefully, then be a widely transferable skill and knowledge across sub-Saharan Africa. In Ireland, we're also supporting an innovative leadership forum on climate smart agriculture, where we have a possibility of debating and spreading the knowledge through inviting international experts and speakers. So uh, I think it's quite clear that Ireland is not just investing in our own domestic production, but we're doing our absolute maximum, and I come back to the introductory remarks by the Secretary, to spread that knowledge. So it seems uh, almost uh, trite to finish up by saying that uh, the way forward is about climate smart, uh, climate smart approach. I think. Uh, we simply haven't got a choice. Uh, we have to find better ways to customize our smart approaches right down to individual farms and to find a way of transferring that knowledge and capacity uh, beyond, uh, beyond our own individual programs. Um, it's an obvious point to make. I think it's uh, an obligation, a political, economic and a moral obligation that we all share. Thank you. So uh, the rest of the time that we have together is an opportunity for questions and answers. Uh, we'll take questions from the audience and uh, also from the web. Good afternoon, Rudy Rutenberg, Agriculture Reporter with Bloomberg News. Um, France has also introduced uh, its uh, agroecology program with the four per thousand uh, carbon uh, in soil uh, program. And uh, the French agriculture minister makes the point that uh, climate smart agriculture is very technology focused and uh, their program goes beyond that in terms of including um, ecosystem management and, and ecosystem adaptation. Can you comment something on that? So whether indeed uh, climate smart is too heavy on the technology side. Thank you. Okay. And just one more question. I'm going to take two questions at a time, then the panel will respond to either one or both of them. One second, sir. One second. Yeah, good morning. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much. I uh, would like to pose a question which has been disturbed. I'm Ranil Sinanayaka, a delegate from Sri Lanka. Uh, what disturbs us greatly at the moment is the fact that scientifically we know that the molecule chlorophyll denatures after 37 degrees. Now, we are going, heading into a world where many of our agricultural areas are going to be at 40 degrees and sometimes over. This would mean whatever we do, there's going to be a collapse in agricultural production. Uh, have we addressed this? Because as a molecule, there's no way that we know at present science that we can tweak this. Um, this is my first question. The second question basically is, We've spoken a lot about everything, including biodiversity, but we have not addressed biomass, which is a critical thing for agriculture, especially the photosynthetic component of biomass. And this then leads to my first question. Thank you very much. Okay, I don't know if uh, any of the panel wants to, to, to respond to either one of those questions, but I'll take a stab at, uh, at, at starting the, the response. Uh, you know, I think it's important for folks to realize that, that we don't, at least from the U.S. perspective, we don't see the Climate Smart Agricultural Alliance as the only way to approach uh, this collective challenge that we have. Uh, the reality is I think we need uh, a variety of approaches. Uh, there is no one silver bullet or single answer. Uh, I think it's a combination uh, of a variety of factors. Uh, it's uh, better forecasting. Uh, it's precision agriculture. Uh, it's absolutely worried about the condition of soil, uh, whether it's the French effort or whether it's the U.S. effort on soil health that's uh, focused on cover crops and understanding the, the nutrient values uh, of each hectare or acre of land. 
so I think it, it's important to, to point out that we see this as a collaborative effort, a, as a coordinated effort, uh, but not necessarily as the sole uh, approach or, or answer. Uh, I think there are a lot of good things about what the French are doing, uh, and I think it very well uh, complements uh, what Climate Smart Agriculture uh, is attempting to do, what the Global Research Alliance is attempting to do, and what some of the other uh, international efforts uh, are designed to do. We're putting out a report today uh, that addresses the second question, uh, which does indeed point out the fact that uh, climate change may very well have an impact on uh, our capacity to meet global food needs, uh, particularly as it relates to global food insecurity, uh, and that the pace of uh, reducing global food insecurity may be negatively impacted if we don't aggressively adapt and mitigate uh, to a changing climate. In the U.S., we've created a thing called Climate Hubs, which is designed to assess the vulnerabilities of each region of the U.S. as it relates to agriculture and forest reproduction. Uh, and once that assessment is concluded, we are now identifying technologies and techniques that will allow uh, our farmers, our producers, to continue to increase uh, productivity while reducing inputs uh, in a sustainable uh, and environmentally appropriate way. Our building block program basically will give farmers the tools uh, that will enable them to continue to be productive, continue to, uh, to adapt to a changing climate. Uh, clearly, research is important. Uh, that's why I mentioned the cultivars that are looking at uh, uh, crops that can grow in shorter growing seasons. Uh, obviously, uh, while this is uh, uh, an issue that not everyone uh, acknowledges. There are seed technologies that are available that could potentially be a response. Uh, there are a wide variety of, of efforts relative to livestock that will increase livestock efficiency. Uh, there is a significant impact as well on aquaculture. So I think there are a number of ways in which we can approach uh, the challenge that's in front of us. But the key is making sure that we're all operating in the same direction, all operating uh, collaboratively that we're sharing information and we're making sure that that information isn't uh, simply benefiting those who already have information but is also widely distributed to folks who are in need of more help and assistance as uh, that my colleagues on the panel have uh, previously discussed. I'm not sure if anyone else would like to take a stab at this. Thank you very much for both questions. Um, first of all, the initiative four by um, 1,000, the French initiative. Um, we are, um, as a country, are um, approving of this initiative. We want to sign this, the initiative because we really uh, think it, it is a good um, initiative and it has to be part of a holistic approach to climate smart agriculture. I don't see that they have to be uh, different or separate. I think that um, we need to, in fact, start um, including carbon sequestration by soils in our um, inventories of emissions and, and capture because this is uh, one of the main things we need to do in uh, climate smart agriculture. Uh, increase the capture of carbon in the soil, and I think uh, this is very much in line with the French initiative. Uh, we uh, see climate smart agriculture as an agroecological approach to um, agriculture. We um, need to think holistically. We don't believe that there is one single uh, solution. We see many solutions working together uh, interacting with each other um, so we can achieve um, productivity, adaptation, and, and mitigation. Um, for example, talking specific practices, we have data from Costa Rica that show that livestock, if you put shade trees in the pastures, livestock produces more and we can have a decrease in temperature of about between four and eight degrees Celsius under the shade, and that decreases the stress on the cattle and makes it be more productive. Things like that. Things like uh, efficient water management, as Secretary Vilsack mentioned it, like if we put 
uh, the nitrogen in drip irrigation, we can reduce uh, nitrous oxide by one, uh, by three times. We can have a threefold reduction, and that is mitigation. We also reduce water use, so that's adaptation, and we increase productivity. So we have to look for those things that interact with each other and give us the three-way result that we want. Uh, so, um, and finally, we need to do a better effort in mitigating so we, in agriculture, can contribute a lot to uh, global warming. Uh, when I do things on so that uh, there are different approaches and especially taking into account very dif different circumstances in, in uh, different countries. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, in, in any way, with any approach, uh, we need to find uh, uh, the way to m motivate uh, farmers and businesses to carry out by themselves a uh, good idea uh, uh, we, uh, we transfer to them. And any uh, uh, climate smart uh, technology must benefit farmers, especially small ones, uh, the poor. Uh, even many of them are hungry. And that's why we need at global level and government level, we need to think of uh, the way to support them. And uh, not only technically, uh, but in in different way and 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 i think that uh, uh, when we are discussing this day of our different targets i think we need to discuss also uh, how to sub how to inform people how to encourage people how to get them involved actively to achieve those targets yeah, just a f very, two very brief points. Uh, um, the first to say that Ireland and France, if you think of EU agriculture, they're the two countries that typically are regarded as the motor of the, the common agricultural policy and the, the policy development. And in many ways, you couldn't think of, you know, a scale issue that would be more dramatic, the size of the agriculture sectors and the countries. It's the complementarity of the practice and the overall direction of the initiative that that really, uh, I think, as I spoke there earlier, I said we, we're interested in making sure that at a local level, as previous speakers have said, individual farms are capable of grasping and grappling with the, the technology or the practice that we introduce. If you can manage that in such diverse circumstances within an EU context, I think it's a good way of looking beyond uh, how the CAP and individual EU member states can bring that capacity uh, to the rest of the countries, uh, really who, particularly the poorer, more vulnerable countries who need it, France and Ireland, both committed to the same goal, delivering on it at local level, sometimes in very different ways. And just a brief point on the technology question. I think that's a very good link between the climate smart agriculture and the bigger project we have underway here. We really need to shift global investment patterns in technology to make them work for us uh, across the climate change agenda, but particularly, and I would agree with uh, what the minister had just said before me, particularly in relation to a capacity to customize solutions and make technology work at the farm level. Thank you. Sorry, we just have a couple minutes left. I'm sorry, we, we've really uh, got some great questions out here. So do you mind if we take three quick questions? We've had three people raise their hands. Okay, and please keep your questions very, very brief, uh, and please identify yourself. Hi, here, stand up, and please identify yourself. As agronomist, I, I agree with the, with the representative from the U.S. that the soil health is the most important. Uh, and then when I look at the uh, at, uh, promise from US, you have the 30 million acre of no tillage, which I interpret as a herbicide resistant crops. How do you value the health hazard with the, with the ecology from the, from the glyphosate in the, in, the, in the environment and for the bacteria and for the, for the human? Uh, 
health. Uh, is this part of the technology you are exporting and continue in US? Just uh, because the World Health Organization said in March that it's probably causing cancer, the glyphosate. And a question here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mastor from the Danish Agriculture and Food Council. Um, we also represent one of the most resource uh, efficient productions in the world, uh, having brought down the emissions from 1990 to, to today with 23% uh, at the same time as increasing the production with 15%. However, my question is, at some, po at some point of time we reach a level where there will be a premium, a premium to make a more resource efficient production like for instance in Denmark, and who's gonna pay that premium? Is that the consumer or is it the farmers? Thank you. And just one more we have right here. Okay, thank you, madam. And thank you, presenters, for the nice presentation. Uh, my just few question is to know how to be, I'm um, Tomie Bakomi from Togo, yeah. Uh, my concern is to know how to be partnership of uh, global alliance and how do you manage to share experiences, innovatives and uh, good practices within countries' membership. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me uh, basically uh, respond to a couple of these questions and then I'd be happy to turn the microphone over to folks. Uh, let me begin with the glyphosate uh, issue, and I think it underscores the fact that there are obviously a variety of opinions about this. Uh, I know there are some questions about the, uh, the scientific background uh, of studies. Uh, our uh, Environmental Protection Agency has uh, basically come to a contrary uh, determination, uh, and it is something that we, I, I suspect, will continue to see used in the U.S., but it's not something we necessarily uh, are going to compel or force or suggest to others unless they are willing uh, to adopt it. This is really not about the U.S. Uh, imposing uh, it, it, its, uh, its focus or its production methods on others. Uh, it's trying really through our Feed the Future initiative, really trying to decide what it is that we can do to be most helpful in other countries. Uh, so if in some countries it may be assisting them in creating uh, more statistical information and data about their markets so that they can more adequately and appropriately price products. In some uh, countries, it may be working with conventional breeding uh, to enhance uh, productivity. In some countries, it may be that they've identified the need for us to work with livestock on a, a disease uh, issue or a crop uh, disease issue. Uh, it really is country-led uh, in terms of our, uh, our efforts. In terms of the Climate Smart Agricultural Alliance, it really is about providing a variety of suggestions and ideas and concepts and then basically uh, allowing countries to adapt uh, to, to adjust or to, uh, to accept some, all, or none uh, of whatever is being proposed. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I think it's important for us to continue to support things like what, uh, what, what the French are doing uh, because I think that complements uh, what we're trying to do with the Climate Smart Agriculture. The more choices, the more variety, the more diversity, uh, the better uh, each country will be uh, able to adapt and mitigate uh, the impacts of climate as it relates to their particular agriculture. Um, you know, the issue of premium and the costs is an interesting one, and I, I think there are several ways to address that. It's possible that we could do this in a way that doesn't necessarily result in a significant increase in, in cost uh, in the following ways. One, research may allow us, enable us to do it less expensively than anticipated, with precision agriculture, we're actually learning to do more with less. Uh, we're learning to do it with less inputs and less costs associated with it. So that may be one way of avoiding this uh, premium. Secondly, there's the issue of trade. Uh, the report that we're issuing today uh, is going to suggest that trade structured properly uh, can be effective in helping uh, address the issue of food security, providing additional choice and lowering the cost uh, of food that's available, particularly in, uh, in poorer countries. That's an option. Um, and, and then finally, I think it's, it, it, you know, uh, to the minister's point, you know, each country is going to take a look at how they might be able to provide the level of assistance and help uh, for producers that encourages them to embrace these uh, initiatives. Uh, in the U.S., uh, it's a risk management tool. It's a, a sharing of risk. Uh, in some other countries, it may be uh, support of a different kind. 
Uh, but I think it's clear that every country is going to look for ways in which they can keep their producers on the land and in the business uh, and doing it in a more effective way. Uh, the market will obviously decide ultimately cost uh, and uh, obviously consumers will have, uh, to the extent they have choice, they'll be able to uh, mitigate uh, whatever costs might be associated with sustainable practices. I think we, our challenge is to figure out how to do all of that and not necessarily burden the consumer, particularly uh, in poorer uh, countries. We do know that if we don't mitigate and adapt, and I'll finish with this, we do know that if we don't adapt and don't mitigate, uh, that the, the ability to get food to where it needs to get to, to, to make sure that food is available and accessible and properly utilized, will be compromised. And if it is compromised, there will be price increases, and that may directly affect the number of people we can help and assist in moving from food insecurity to food secure. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're so anxious to get working, why we're anxious to have this alliance to try to find what works best for each individual country and then provide the, the assistance, whether it's financial or technical, to make sure that farmers get that information and use it. My, my apologies, but we are over time, so if you could just be very, very brief. My apologies, Minister. Thank you. Okay, I, I agree with uh, Secretary Vilsack. I, I think that climate smart agriculture doesn't need to be more uh, expensive. We uh, have proved in, uh, in our uh, country that we can reduce inputs while uh, increasing productivity by using uh, the right uh, technologies. Um, but also, I would refer you to um, this document that I um, mentioned earlier, Wake Up Before It Is Too Late. Just look it up in the web because the chapter five has a whole chapter on uh, trade rules as related to climate change, and it will be very interesting if you have a chance to uh, go through it, uh, because um, we don't have very much time to go through it, but i just leave you the homework to go and read that document, yes. Uh, when I am from uh, developing countries, when I am think, when I talk of agriculture, I think of small holders, very, very small. And they are the most vulnerable uh, with climate change. And that's why I think that uh, before uh, we allow the market to find the way to respond, uh, the government need to uh, pay more attention to have uh, agriculture sector. And, in, and I think that international community need to find the way to have developing countries and particularly farm sector in those uh, countries. Two seconds just to say a note of optimism maybe at the end that uh, you know certainly in terms of the, the premium that was mentioned from the floor, I think that we, we, we are looking at efficiencies coming uh, directly into play in, in our own direct experience in Ireland, and that's something that we're trying to transfer in terms of the knowledge to the local markets, particularly in our developing countries. I'd also say optimistically that we've had to look at very big vested interests in car production and other markets like energy producers, and we have found that some of the, the, the challenges at the beginning have been overcome. So I would be slightly optimistic that particularly in climate smart agriculture, there may be pathways through that won't mean such heavy interventions as might have been suggested. I'm going to take the prerogative of one additional comment, and that is uh, a focus on food waste. A third of the food that's produced in this uh, world today is not used for the purposes for which it was intended. In developed countries, it's often wasted and, and placed in landfills that creates methane. That can significantly help us address this global food security uh, challenge uh, in a changing climate. And in developing countries, it's working with developing countries to do a better job of uh, post-harvest uh, uh, storage and better utilization of, of the food so that if you reduce that food waste today, the 805 million people, there would probably be enough food to feed those 805 million. So food waste is also an issue that needs to be addressed and needs to be part of the conversation internationally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A warm round of applause for our distinguished speakers.